Hey guys, I just wanted to jump in here as uh, this may be the longest podcast that I've ever done to date with Denzel Rodriguez. And we talked about a lot of things. We talked about his story. We talked about velocity banking. We talked about infinite banking. We talked about some of the misconceptions of infinite banking. And even at the end of the podcast, um, you'll see where him and I disagree on some things and we, and we really um, do it in a nice way. But I feel like your IQ will increase by just hearing the different um, versions, different ways of speaking. Um, and so the reason I want to share this is we on our YouTube channel are going to kind of split some of these short uh, into shorter elements like velocity banking on what he's talking about leverage, what he's talking about infinite banking. So should you run your expenses through your infinite banking policy? We'll, we'll chop that up so it's easier to consume. Um, and I was thinking like, should we put this long podcast um, and long form uh, interview up? And the answer is yes, because some of you guys will want to watch the whole thing, and some of you guys will just wait to see the shorter videos. With that, I wanted to just thank you so much for um, all the amazing comments and uh, questions and support that we've gotten. We're continuing to make videos on personal finance, on insurance, on uh, you know business to help you live more intentionally. And we're just super, super grateful for you giving us the support to be able to do that. The man, the myth, the legend himself, Denzel Rodriguez. Welcome to the show, dude. I'm glad you're on. I, I'm glad uh, we we're making this work, and I'm I'm so honored to have you on my YouTube channel and podcast. Dude, it's an honor and a privilege to have had the opportunity to actually meet you in person. So that was pretty cool. And now we're uh, collaborating for the first time. So it's it's an awesome, awesome experience uh, being able to work with you. Uh, in this collaboration and i really look forward to future partnerships down the road so i'm happy to be here man i got a lot of energy going so <laughs> I, fire I away it. between you and me we're, we're open books and we'll go anywhere i um, just want to tee this up you're very much i mean you had over forty thousand subs on on youtube you talk about velocity banking you talk about infinite banking you talk about kingdom building you talk about all kinds of stuff and you what i love about your style is you just i feel like you just turn on the camera you're like all right let me start talking and uh you're you don't hold anything back and you're very authentic <laughs> and honest i just appreciate that about you um and so before we jump into infinite banking why life insurance what what is velocity banking that that's something i would love to articulate uh, or for you to articulate to to our audience um i i want to first ask you what was some of the key elements in your life that made you be the person that you are today? And, you know, this YouTube channel didn't happen on accident. You put a lot of time and energy into it. What made you be the kind of person that wanted to turn on the camera and talk about money and just be honest about your faith and all that? And so I'm kind of teeing up the, the floor for you to take this wherever you want it, but want to give uh, our audience context before we get into the, the nitty gritty. I would say some key details uh, that key experiences I had uh, just going back to the start of the YouTube channel started in uh, August ish of 2018. I started recording videos on my commute to and from work uh, at the top of the year beginning of 2018. Uh, prior to that, go back four more years, I graduate high school 2014. And I had a couple of decisions to make. Either I was going to go to college. That was option one. Option two was military. Um, and option three was figure it out on my own. Yeah. Well, option one was add the picture because I didn't get accepted into any college I applied for. So that was an issue. And option two, I don't think I just, when I was uh, talking to recruiting agents in the military, just something was not right uh in in terms of me being in that department serving whether it was a a, a war fighter or tech or construction whatever it was something wasn't right and maybe the other thing was fear uh fear of serving in my country uh so things just weren't in alignment there and then three i was like well i'm gonna figure this thing out on my own as soon as i said that i got a call a couple days later from a, a marketing company called Vector Marketing. Come to find out, this company sells high-end kitchen cutlery, and that is called Cutco, yep. that brand. Yep. Um, I show up to an interview. These people seemed really, 
freaking excited about selling knives. They blew me away. I was like, all right, I got nothing better to do. I was working at an Italian restaurant and I was playing video games all day long. That's really like was my day was playing video games, doing sports activity. I was in wrestling. I was in band. I was in football. So I, you know, I enjoyed sports, love playing video games, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare. I mean, Gears of War, you name it, Halo, all of it, done it all. Right. And then uh, once I showed up to training at, at Cutco, they exposed me to speaking, communication, networking, sales, um, follow up, email, text, scripts, sales scripts, referrals, how to get leads. I mean, my mind was blown at the potential of how much money I could make just selling knives. And in my brain, I was like, well, if I can learn how to sell knives, I could probably sell anything like, and that was a key uh, uh, shift in my life. And I was 18 at the time from 2015, 2014, 2015, all the way up to 2018, I still remained with, um, I had, I always had like a consistent job, right? And I bounced in and out of network marketing, MLMs, direct sales companies. I was selling everything. I was selling Invicta watches. You name it. I was in and out of it. Skincare products, protein shakes, you name it. Um, I, I sucked at all of them, right? I made a little money, failed, made a little money, failed, made a little money, failed, made a little money, failed. But along that whole entire path um, in, in the faith world, um, whenever you talk to your pastor or, or someone of faith, usually they, they say something to you and they're like, I received this from the Holy Spirit, right? So they'll say something along the lines of, I see this in you, which would be your gift or your, your skill, or your talent, a, a treasure that you hold. And before you realize it, other people say it. And what, what starts to make you believe it is when all different walks of life start saying the same thing. So for me, from 2015 all the way through 2018, people would tell me, Denzel, you have a good voice. You got a strong name. You could be on radio. You have a nice, solid voice. You have a nice voice. You could speak. You could do this. Like I kept hearing that over and over again. Coming up to 2018, it just finally clicked. One person whom I met, his name is Alex Albrand. Shout out to him. He has a marketing business. And he said, dude, you should record videos. He was a little more specific the way he said it. Yeah. You should record yeah. videos. You have a solid voice. You can get on social media. And you can share and teach th these things that you know. It, it seems like you've got some really radical, uh, pretty interesting financial concepts. I, I mean, I've never heard of this stuff, but it seems like it really could work. And I was like, all right. And within a few weeks, um, I just I bought one of them little magnetic things on, on that you put in the AC in your car and you hold the phone, like with yeah. the Uber drivers yeah. and the Lyft drivers. So I just did that, click record, started talking about velocity banking. What is it? How does it work? How I've been doing it? How's it work for me? How I paid off my debt? And then I said, you know what? Maybe I should kind of write this out. I bought a little easel board in my room. Literally, you go to my YouTube channel, you can see the evidence. You could see my room and you could tell it's a bedroom because you can see like a little piece of a bed on the in the video. I didn't I didn't know how to edit, record, shoot, nothing. I mean, my top my head was cut off. It's not as clean as this what you see right now. So you can go back and you can actually see the evolution of where I came from. I share my story and all that good stuff, but those are some key details. And then thirdly was my belief, faith, and surrender in Christ Jesus, right? Being my Lord and Savior, uh, receiving wisdom through the Holy Spirit into my life, just surrendering to what I think I know about the world, surrendering to what I think I know about money, and just starting from a clean slate. And my prayer has always been help me unlearn and relearn what I think I know about the kingdom, what I think I know about money, what I think I know about the economy, geopolitics, polit you name it, right? And I, I have this, you know, uh, people call it this voice, 
I give it credit where credit's due. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through you, right? That's your communication through frequencies and whatever you want to call it. But it's essentially the Holy Spirit talking to me and ministering me to deliver my purpose, my original intent, my reasoning for existence here on planet Earth. And to do that effectively, righteously with ethics, morals, and values, here we are today, you know, building a, a seven-figure business and making more money than I ever could imagine. And that's not even nothing compared to the potential, um, helping tens of thousands of people, being able to talk to people like Caleb, where most would have to go through all these loopholes. And it's like, the Lord is just opening doors, opening doors. He also closes doors. Yeah. Right. But he opens he more than, doors, than right? slams doors. And I, I embrace that because it's a relationship. Yeah. Right. And sometimes I'm going to have a disagreement with God, but then at the end of the day, I remember, Oh, well, you did create me. So, um, you probably know more than I do. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to suck it up, uh, uh, dust my boots off and, uh, knock on the next door. Right. Right. Talk right. to the next person, talk to the next lead, make the next sale. Right. Uh, get the next referral, help whoever it is that I need to serve. So those are the key, key details that have occurred in my life. And I've just been steadfast, staying consistent all the way through. Well, one of the things that I want to highlight about you is you're very abundant. Um, you're very open to collaborations. You want people to win. Um, you're very honest. And I think there's no, there's no doubt. And there's, there's a really great blueprint that you have on your, on your YouTube on how to be successful. Cause you just put yourself out there. And I, I'm, I think there's someone that's watching this. There's someone that's listening to this that needs to start doing something. You might not know what that thing is, but uh, you're making excuses on why um, you're not doing it on because of what your parents will think or your, your friends will think, or um, you know, a, a random person on the internet, what they'll comment. And it's like, man, it is so freeing when you're, when you're doing this out of gratitude and you're not your identity and your happiness is not built up on comments or what other people think of you and you have a pure intention. So that's all the things that come to my mind when I think of who you are. And that's why I'm so grateful that you are in my life and vice versa. Um, I'm very grateful to be speaking to you. So when, when it comes to like, you're starting to make videos, um, you have a friend that's like, Hey, you should start talking about these unique strategies. Um, first of all, what 18 year old understands velocity banking, how in the world did you go from playing video games and all that stuff to like, being able to articulate velocity banking. So I want you to break down what is, is velocity banking, how you learned about it, and how you can clearly articulate it um, so that someone listening to this can um, hear this or someone watching this can be like, oh, that's velocity banking. This is when I should look at doing that. And this is when I probably shouldn't look at doing that. Gotcha. So I'll give you the logical answer. I'll also give you the faith answer. So <laughs> the, the faith response, how did I come across this concept? I truly believe the Lord, our Heavenly Father, gave this information to me without putting a title on it or, or a concept on it. It was just a way of being, right, in my finances. As soon as I turned 18 or 17, I remember getting my first credit card with Wells Fargo, $300 secured credit card. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it came with rewards, but I'm not too sure. Regardless, I was, I had one bill, which was my phone bill. Mm -hmm. And somehow my brain said it would make sense to run the bill on the credit card and pay it off in 30 days in full. Once I discovered the second and third credit card, I think it was like Discover, Bank of America, it came with these cashback rewards. First, you got to build credit. Then you start getting access to some really cool things in the credit space. One of them being cashback rewards, 0% offers, et cetera, et cetera. So here I am, little old, you know, 18, 19 year old Denzel working, making cash, right? I'm getting paid off the books and I'm taking that cash and I'm establishing credit. So instead of putting my money in a savings account, which what everybody said, I literally took the savings that I had was 300 bucks and I secured it, got a credit card. And I started using it to pay my bills. And then I pay myself back, no interest. Once that credit card graduated, become unsecured, they gave me like, I think it was like a thousand bucks of credit. And I think that's when I got like cashback rewards. Mm -hmm. 
I would running, I was running bills. Anytime I went on a date, any gas, food, miscellaneous, whatever, help a mom, you name it. I would run anything and everything I could through that card and then pay back in full offsetting some of my expenses by $30, $50 a, a month. Because right? you're, you're saying least. there's two things that you're doing. You're deferring your payment, but then you're also getting points. Yeah. And you're saying, if I'm already going to pay for the cell phone, if I'm already going to pay for this date or whatnot, I have the money. Instead of paying cash for that, I'm going to run it through a credit card and get all the benefits of using that credit card. Right. And this is 17, 18 year old Denzel doing this. Right. And then even after high school, I'm, I'm, I'm doing these things. And at the time, I would say something is telling me something. But now I give credit where credit's due. Holy right. Spirit's guiding me right. the whole way through. And uh, just to give that context there on the on the faith side. So that's simple. Moving forward, I realize, well, if the bank's willing to give me more credit according to the score and the way that I use my funds, what if I just kept doing it and applied for more? Right. So I'm, I'm like, these, I, nobody taught me this. You go back three generations in either bloodline, mother, father, all of them have debt. All of them, barely any of them went to college. Barely any of them have homes. They're all in debt, right? Go either way, either direction from my bloodline. No one has this knowledge. So somehow I got it. Right. And, uh, and then giving credit where credit's due. Now here's the logical part going to Cutco getting involved in network marketing companies, direct sales, all these companies, they send you to uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Grant Cardone, uh, Tony Robbins, um, you name it, any guru in the finance space that talks money, I was reading their books. So the concept came before the strategy was revealed. Very interesting to how when you look in, I believe it's either in uh, uh, Genesis, I believe, where, where God kind of breaks down how he, no, it's actually, actually in Ephesians. Ephesians talks about the, the mind of God, how he works. And essentially, God starts with the end result, right? So he plans everything out. It's already predestined. Everything's already complete. He starts with the end in mind, and then he goes back and he starts in the beginning, blah, 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 right? God created blah, blah, blah. So in, in my life, in the finance, getting exposed to these concepts, it was almost like the end result was revealed to me, but then through logical resources, such as books, courses, seminars, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, meeting people like you and many others in my journey, the strategy started to cultivate itself and come together. Finally, 2017, this is years later, 2017, I discovered the name of the concept that I'm doing. I learned it from the Mormons, from a company called Renatus. It's run, ran, I think, by a, a Mormon guy, real estate education company. They call it Velocity Banking. They say they got it from Australia, in Australia, they call it mortgage acceleration or debt acceleration using offset accounts. So they say it comes from Australia. America adopted it, called it velocity banking. So you got the Mormons practicing it. I've come across quite a few Jewish communities that practice this, Asian communities. And I was just like, well, shoot, I'm Puerto Rican, Colombian. No, nobody talk about this stuff. What is this? You know? Um, and then I realized, I was like, what they were teaching, they were like, go get a credit card and pull money from here to make a chunk here. I was like, huh, I kind of been doing that, you know, and, and I, I acquired a personal unsecured revolving line of credit for about three to 5k at a 10% simple interest rate. I was able to manipulate the rate all the way down to like three to 5% in terms of what I'm actually paying on a, on a, a month to month basis as I borrow the funds to gain access to more wisdom, more knowledge, more cash flow. And so I answered it logically, faith, here we are. Now I've just gotten to the point where I've mastered it in a sense, right? And it's, it's worked out very well. And it's part of my fundamental groundwork for building my uh, personal financial management system in my personal 
life, but also business is a foundational thing, just like people have their foundational minimalist approach. Right. Some people have a foundational seven baby step approach from uh, Dave Ramsey. Velocity banking is my foundational approach for the 21st century. Right? So and it when, when well. you break down velocity banking, yeah, the way that I think of velocity banking is I think of using a home, using a HELOC, running money through that. It sounds like your version of velocity banking is, you know, the home, the 0% credit cards, essentially let's, if we can get points, if we can defer our payment and we can create more cash flow, we're using leverage at, and, and creating more cash flow, getting more points. And you're not playing with fire because you're paying it off, but you would admit that if, if you're not disciplined, it could backfire on you. Correct. And to go even a layer deeper, just looking at the words velocity banking, I take velocity, one of my banking money. The goal is how many times can you use your dollars more than once? Most people think one time, pull the dollar, pay for something, the dollar's gone. Yep. I like to leverage that $1 up to as many as seven times before I release my initial seed, which was that initial dollar. How can I take this dollar, make it three, borrow two, create six to 10, pay back the three. Yep. I never lost the one. Right. Right. It was still in my possession. So um, that's one intent is right. how many times can we leverage more than $1? That's velocity. And then banking is the flow, right? Yep. The flow, the velocity of money, the speed and direction at which money moves, right? We're solving for that. And then thirdly, everything is about cash flow, right? How can I create enough cash flow to supply my daily requirements of living? Right. I recently learned the difference between requirements and needs, right? In in the faith realm, so to speak. You know, as as a born again faith believer, technically I have no needs because my needs are met by my supplier, right. God the Father. Right. But since you're a flesh body, you still have requirements to sustain your flesh, food, water, shelter money, resources, et cetera. So my intent is how do I supplement my requirements with cash flow right. to the point where I'm now living in abundance and excess, I have no worry. Right. And I've been able to reach that in literally one to um, one to four years. So I've been in business now four years. And now I'm at a point where I'm, I'm living in, in what's called uh, kingdom living kingdom environment where I have completely supplemented my, all of my requirements to live and sustain this body, this flesh, right? And I'm now able to be an abundant giver. I'm able to receive in abundance because I've created the systems to receive in abundance. That's where people pay you money, right? A lot of people forget that part. Um, they like to give, give, give and help, 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 but um, you also need to replenish, right? There's, a, there has to be a flow. So that's what velocity banking solves for. So it's way more than just borrowing money from the banks, right? right? It has to do with that fundamental, a reminder in your brain, right? I'm solving for right. cash flow, And how many times can I leverage this $1? Because leverage gives me an advantage over others. Yep. Right. I agree. To, to move faster, to get ahead, to uh, beat the so-called algorithms of the world, so to speak, the math equations. I'm, I'm, my purpose is to walk in my purpose, my original intent, my, my reasoning for existence. So I need to pull resources together in order to conduct myself effectively so that others may see how they can also do it. Right. So that I'm not giving right. them negative energy, giving them nothing but positivity in their life because they're seeing the, the, the confidence, the, the language, right? The belief, like a true believer, 
in everything that I do. Um, and so that's what we saw for. That's the blueprints that I lay out in my videos that are hour, hour and a half long. They're not Mickey Mouse 10 minute clips where I'm selling you the concept. I'm literally right. giving you the whole cake and you can eat it too. Right. And you don't have right. to pay me a dime, right? I've made it very transparent in my videos. I'm like, I, I need y'all to get this because there is a issue in our country. Like right. you've said multiple right. times in your videos about saving, how important it is to save and just these fundamental things that, mm. and I just like to take it a step, a layer deeper and say, well, how do you right. save? Well, and that's where, if, if you right? don't mind, you address that too. Right. I would love to get actually into the nuts and bolts. Cause I think people really appreciate that. I'll just, I'll just comment on a couple of things. Velocity, money in motion creates more money. Um, it's a, it's an amazing, um, principle to live by. Um, though when you think of banking, uh, you think of institutions that are doing it better than us and, and just the flow. And I, I love that. And then cash flow ultimately is the financial metric that makes the world go around. And if you're truly wanting to measure um, your financial success now and in the future, cash flow is the most accurate way to do that um, because it is the thing that makes the world go around. So I really appreciate um, just your heart behind this and, and your philosophy. Let's get, let's get into the nuts and bolts. When you say your goal is to, with one seed, i.e. one dollar, which is becoming less and less valuable as we speak, um, with one dollar, you're trying to get seven uses. I love that. Can we get practical and say, how, how are you going about that? And um, I think that that's, that's going to be an amazing hack if we can plant that seed Definitely. with people. Yeah. So I, I always, um, when I'm working with people's numbers, you know, I got to get the, the most important stuff. I start with income, expense, debt, and cash flow. I need to know where you're at, where you've been, and where you want to go. So I start with your four major numbers how you're currently operating. Um, I'll go back in time. This is my numbers back in uh, 2018 before I started the YouTube channel, right? I was a um, little like 25 to 30K in debt with a net cash flow every, now, every month, roughly 500 bucks, right? And what I was trying to figure out is how do I take this to and make it 20 grand? Right. So I had to set the initial goal. A lot of people are like, they start here. I want to remove debt. And that's great. You know, and if I've, I teach people this too, but I try to also plant the small seed that says, hey, what if we just simply added a zero to your current income per month? That's 10x. Right. So that's one strategy right there. I'm taking this, this 2000 bucks and I need to get my goal is to try to get seven uses out of right. every single dollar. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and then I also kind of go over like seven different essentially models of which we can do that. Then there's also the, the steps, like how many times did that money get a use before it left you. Right. Right. And even after it left you, how do we make it come back to you? Right. So um, leverage number one is obviously the concept velocity banking, learning that. Okay. Two is infinite banking. So when you say the concept of velocity banking, it's take out a credit card or refinance your house. In and of itself. Right. In and of itself, I, I've got money and I need to decide what, what do I want to do with it? Do I want to go into debt to create debt that creates cash flow? Okay. Or do I want to acquire debt that helps me pay off debt? So velocity banking solves for both. And okay. that would be in the case of getting a credit card, personal line of credit, HELOC, and, and right. you're saying, because normally, and this is my criticism to Velocity Bankers, is they're like, except, like their whole goal is to pay off your mortgage. And, and I think that's silly, but their whole deal is let's mm -hmm. accelerate your debt so that we can pay off debt. And you're saying you can do Velocity Banking and build assets, which mathematically Correct. may be more strategic. Mathematically may be more strategic. Um, and unfortunately, what, what, what happens in this very 
overwhelming amount of information, the, the age of information that we're in, it can be difficult to transition someone from a Dave Ramsey mindset right, right into right. the world of velocity banking. So velocity banking to accelerate debt is a bridge. I got it. It helps them yeah. kind of get out of that funk of being cheap and poor minded yep. to. Yeah. So, so in hey, other words, I, 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 yeah. if you can use velocity banking to help them pay off their debt faster, then it's like, okay, I, I now got a hold of you. Yes. And then, then it's like, okay, is the goal to be debt free or is the goal to maybe take a step back and have more cash flow? So you can go back to your drawing. I just, I just want to exactly. like emphasize that. And I appreciate you articulating that. Yeah. And perfect example would be in 2018, that was my in the door, helping you pay off debt. Everybody wants to pay off debt, right? And become debt free. Okay, cool. I got you in the door. I'm building no like, and trust. And now I'm speaking with clients that I've acquired in 2018, 2019. They've paid off most of their debt, except for their mortgage and student loans. Those are the two big ones that are, are left. And then they're like, Denzel, it's going to take me like Five to seven years on average, that's what Velocity Banking does. That snowball debt avalanche averages nine to 13 years on average with those strategies. So five to seven years is much better than nine to 13. That's not bad at all. Okay, great. Well, then I say, well, in that same amount of time, Caleb, instead of you becoming debt-free in five to seven years, what if I helped you go from making five grand a month to 50,000 a month in the same time frame? And then you can literally write a check, Caleb, to pay off all your debt right. in year right. four point nine. I get it. Five point six, right? So yep. like that's that's like my my in the door. I, I, I unfortunately I can't lead with that right away. Uh, it it doesn't sound real. It's not tangible enough. Or I just need to work on my speaking skills, right? And that's you know that's not bad. I'm only twenty six, so it's gonna take time. But velocity banking. I get a personal line of credit or HELOC. I'm making two grand a month. If I get access to 10 grand, which is what I did, making two grand, mm -hmm. I got access to a $10,000 personal line of credit at a uh, at the time was a was a 10% rate. So two to 10, I've already multiplied the, the money. Right. 500 is my cash flow per month times 12. That's 6K a year. Right. I'm, I'm thinking, what is the most effective way to, to use this free net cash flow? I can only reduce my expenses by so much. Right. That there, that's a limit. Here, income has no limitation other than my own self belief about that. So I'm trying to break that and I formulate and get into these concepts. So, you know, three, 10 X would be another concept. I integrate with this infinite banking is the whole idea of recapturing all of this. Right. So it's like, how do I recapture my expenses? Oh, well you could potentially, if done correctly, you can run it through a cash value life insurance policy in combination with your cash flow to cover the cost of that tool. And then now I dump. I dump six plus expenses right. into this new vehicle, which now that vehicle comes with a death benefit, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions, mm -hmm. depending on your age, health, and finances. So notice how that's another use of money. Right. Okay. And then I can borrow the same money I seeded in the form of cash value loans at an interest rate. And then maybe I see that into helping myself move from E and S yep. to B and I. Yeah. Right. And you're referencing Robert Kiyosaki instead of being in Robert the, Kiyosaki in 500, yeah. you know, or more yeah. labor force. And that is another form of leveraging your dollars is right. acquiring right. a labor force that can fulfill the mission and vision that you have for your life in which can also help other people's right. missions and visions. So now you're, now you're sprinkling the infield, spreading the wealth, right? So that's another uh, leverage is the, the, the B quad model, right? And then five, which is because B quad, now, is, that, is that the business quadrant right here? Like yeah. The businesses? business quadrant 
500 or more labor force. I'm only at two. When and I'm you already say 500 generating. or more at labor force, what do you mean by that? Big business. Got it. Right. The intent should you should have the intent of going big and nothing less. Is, right. is that the 10x model based off of Grant That's Cardone? That's the 10x like, model. 10X. Right, right. Yep. Thinking big, you know, getting out of thinking small. Right. My, my, um, you know, there's only one Denzel on planet Earth. There will only ever be one. There will only ever be one Denzel on planet Earth. I'm so unique, right? So different that I should maximize the time I have here because I'm only here for a limited time. Right. 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 And while I'm here, I also want to maximize my time on figuring out where am I going eternally? Because if I don't figure that out, right. none of this right. crap matters, right? Like none of this crap matters. You can obtain the whole world, lose your soul, and now you're in another place for eternity that you don't necessarily want to be. You, right. you didn't maybe intent to be there, but you ended up there because you didn't focus on the, the matters at hand that truly concerns your life overall. And so the faster that I can help people become free from this master, which is money, to then discover who their real uh, master is. So leverage five. Um, so I did the B quad, right? That's another use of money. And then five, because you're in business, now it's all about reduce, re reducing your tax liability. Yeah, that's fair. So, so, so one, you're two, saying, three, four, five, like saying, just over and over again. You're saying if you're already paying a tax and mm -hmm. you're now a business owner and you're able to deduct certain things or through a corporate structure, figure out how to reduce something, that's a dollar that was leaving and now you're attaining it. And so that's like a quote unquote infinite return, which by the way, this is not right. investment of advice. Don't sue us. <laughs> but that that's is that your concept of another lever? Another correct. It's right. like, wait a minute, if I can tap into my tax liability right. and reduce it from five percent, reduce it all the way down to ten percent or less, or or in some cases, in many cases, ideally reducing it to zero, nada, nothing that now produces cash flow and again this money is now being rinsed and going into the the structures right of of leverage over and over again right right so honestly um there's there's two other ones i i, I lost it in, in my head yep, yep. but yep. five is enough one right. is enough right. two is enough like when i'm dealing with a single mom three four kids never really managed finances a day in her life and right. then loses a husband, the spouse passes away and now they're responsible. Here's how I work with them. I love you it, know? dude. I, I love the I, leverage. I mean, in fact, meet them where they're at. I, um, I have this talk and I'm, I'm, my next book is going to be called value leveraging. And it's this whole idea of provide value, um, and, and be wow. valuable and then amplify that value. And we actually go through 14 elements of how to leverage. And let me talk about o OPA or o OPM, other people's money, but then OPA is other people's audiences. And then you have the podcast effect and you have the whiteboard effect, which you use and the YouTube effect. And it's um, the coding effect and there's the charisma effect. These are all things that you have that can create this, this amplification. Um, and the problem is, and this is really the thing that I want to talk about is if your, your philosophy is not built on value, the worst thing you could do is take out credit cards and then put in unvaluable things or take out a bunch of Correct. debt or do infinite banking. And all those things are like, they are amplifiers and they're either going to mm -hmm. amplify good or bad. Um, I want to talk about infinite banking. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about that? And then let's talk about infinite banking. Cause there's some things you, you, you help me on. remember. You helped me remember the other two. You said it. Other people's audiences. I say other people's stages. Yep. Um, in terms of speaking, uh, Kingdom Authority is a leverage accessing a, another infinite resource, which is your gift. And I talk about the levels of authority with my uh, clients, and I talk to them about how you how do we get back to the author, right? Right. And if you're the author of something you have authority over what you wrote. So if you're, Caleb wrote a book called The And Asset, he's the author. 
everything in that book is his, his concepts, his strategies, his ideas, his philosophies are in that book. If I want to figure out what's in that book before I read it, I got to go to him. Well, because he wrote it, he has authority to talk about it. And because he has authority to talk about it, he's authorized, right? He's giving authorization to have others sell it for him, AKA B quad, right? Having others push the book for him like myself, because I read it and I know it's a good book. Right. And then this video is going to go on my channel, OPA, other people's audiences, people are going to buy that book, which again, he's authorizing me because I read it. And if I read his material and I become a master in it as well, it would be wise of him to then give authorization to those who believe in his concepts right. that, that want to, you know, move forward with it. And because I'm not the author, but he gave me authority to speak on it, authorization, it leaves me with, I can authentically preach, talk, speak, share about his book called The And Asset, right? And that right there is a huge leveraging flow of financial resources, money to fulfill your requirements to live on this planet, right? And then live in abundance. So that was going to be my other leverage mentality. So these are all the leverages that I like to incorporate with somebody's dollars. I think it's great. I think it's an even better mental exercise because if you can start getting people to start thinking bigger, thinking outside the box, it's yeah. uh, we don't live in a linear world. And uh, I just had a video um, that went out that essentially says, is debt dumb and is cash king? And essentially, it's like this cash, if you read on your dollar bill, it's a reserve note, a federal reserve note. So is it possible that we're just dealing with a unleveraged debt and everything's debt and it doesn't make debt good. It doesn't make paying cash bad. It just makes it all kind of on the same playing field. And it goes back to what if there was another metric like cash flow that we could measure things from. So love, love that concept. And it's like you and I didn't come overnight and just like come out of the womb thinking these things. It really is based on principles. One thing I will also say is um, the, the beauty of network marketing is it's a very cheap, education because you get around people that are thinking big you're reading yeah. books they're challenging they're making you sell um i have a ton of respect for people in the uh, lds uh faith because they're they're going two two years on a mission and knocking on doors and 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 they are building some in, uh, incredible resilience and i think it's some of the same with network marketing now that's all i'll say there's pros and cons and um, I, I could, we could probably do a whole video on the pros and cons to network marketing, but, um, I think it's cool that you are the type of person, regardless what money you made in network marketing, you're the type of person because of the other leverage effects that came from you being there. And I think, uh, it just all comes full circle. Um, anything else that you want to mention that before we talk about infinite banking, cause you mentioned some things and I would really, really like to, to share and talk through. And I think we're going to serve a lot of people and just our dialogue as it relates to infinite banking pros and cons of that and just language behind what we say i would i would just say just to kind of close the the conversation with velocity banking for right now because we're just having a conversation here for those that are listening to the conversation you're getting the mindset the mind of m the way i think of these concepts you want to get the actual blueprints and formats that's you know totally different you know video where i lay out the numbers and stuff but also keep in mind at the end of the day, all I'm trying to do is borrow from Peter to either pay Paul to do a job, to do a work for me that produces cash flow, or to acquire Paul's asset, aka real estate, small business, et cetera, or stock, or whatever that may be. If I'm paying from, uh, if I'm borrowing from Peter to pay Paul off, my intent is when I borrowed from Peter, he's not charging me any interest. Paul was charging me interest. So if I can simply borrow at zero cost and pay off something that was costing me something, and then I recapture the cash flow from that, you are essentially beating the interest versus you just taking your net free cash flow each and every month and applying it to Paul each and every month. 
Paul's going to hit you no matter what with interest. Whether you use all your cash flow, 50% of your cash flow, 25%, 100%, you're still going to pay interest. What if you could completely eliminate the interest, right. offset it, right. and now put, put you in a better financial position to then say, okay, now that I know how to leverage a little bit, I paid off my car, paid off some credit cards, wiped out my uh, personal loan and this business loan, got this mortgage left and student loans. Well, before I tackle that beast, what if I acquired three more beasts like that, but actually instead of me paying it, it pays me. So it's just, I just switched yep. the mindset on you. And that's where we get into leveraging to create cash flow rather than leveraging to just pay off debt. You always have to deal with taxation, inflation, and devaluation. So inflation, you combat that by eliminating interest a bit, but you're not really truly breaking even, right? So in velocity banking, full transparency, you're not going to solve for all three if you're just paying off debt. But if you solve for cash flow, you can absolutely cover all three, get ahead of all three, taxation, inflation, and devaluation of the dollars, right? So we'll close it out right there and then step into infinite banking because that's even well, what's the difference a more of a powerful concept. What's the difference between inflation and devaluation? Because I feel like they're very similar. Inflation they are very inflation. similar, but from my education and just speaking with some other folks, um, inflation just simply means that the price of something goes up, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that the value of the currency went down. Something else, if I'm understanding correctly, something else causes the value of the currency to drop. And that has to do with printing more money. But it's a correlation. If I print more money, right. I need to raise my price on these products and services because now there's more of this money. But why? Right? Like I, I, I try to ask, well, why? Why would I increase my prices? Some people do not increase their pricing. Some people do. Right. So that's how I knew. I was like, wait, there is a difference. Yeah, that's fair. Inflation is different. And then devaluation is something totally different having to do with printing, mismanagement of funds. And then the taxation part is a whole nother monster yeah. on, on, yeah. on every single dollar that, that comes into your totally. economy. So being yeah. able to remove yeah. that and then get into vehicles like infinite banking, like real assets, tangible assets, non-duplicatable assets can combat inflation. Regardless of what happens to the currency, the asset will always remain. It'll always preserve its, its value. It cannot technically devalue, right? A house will always be a house, right? It provides a place for you to live. How can that possibly devalue itself other than, you know, maintenance and, and that kind of thing. But if I maintain the asset, if I have something like gold, or if I have something like silver or cash value, it's not that the asset is devaluing, it's the currency. So it requires more of that currency to purchase that asset, but it's still the same asset. Gold right. will always be gold. A house will always be a house. A business will always be a business, but for some reason it's costing more. So that's where I, separate yeah. the three taxation yeah, no, and inflation then, devaluation yeah, yeah i think it's, it's a, a tough one i, I still get confused myself <laughs> it, it, yeah, totally and i think it's at the end of the day um I, people say it differently and when you we inflate the money supply um it rb dollars become less valuable and and as a re relate they correlate and at the same time you're totally right like that is there's other factors it would be foolish for us to think just printing of money there's probably more factors but more fact, when correct. we when we're printing trillions and trillions of dollars and we're like, huh, I wonder why all the prices are increasing, um, mm -hmm. you know, but there's there's uh, people in, in power that would disagree with that economic logic. And so who am I? You know, uh, let's talk <laughs> about infinite banking and um, my 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 two cents on infinite banking is, you know, you utilize a life insurance policy. Um, a lot of people choose to do whole life. You overfund it. Some people call it fully funding it meaning you're maximizing the cash, you're minimizing the, the base insurance cost, and you're using uh, things like term riders and PUA riders to stack the cash. 
And the benefits that you get is you get your $1 to grow the rest of your life with special tax advantages. You can uh, lend against it or borrow against it. You get your life insurance benefits in, in the future, gives you different options. It protects you, um, creates a legacy effect. In some cases, allows entrepreneurs like you and I to save more money. Um, and if we're going to get a uh, wooey, it helps you show up more powerfully. It might uh, unlock some areas of thinking. It might allow you to take on more quote unquote risk or opportunities because you know that your foundation is secure. So it's like right there, those are six leverage effects of quote unquote infinite banking. And it's, and it's yes. not, and I just want to be very, 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 very clear that um, life insurance when set up and used properly is not an investment, but over time it can be a very efficient place to save your money. And it's, um, one of the most efficient paper assets when it comes to privacy and other benefits. Anything that you want to add to that? Because then I want to get into some of the language that we use, some of the confusion that I think people have, some of the mistakes people make, and how you can use infinite banking, how you've, you're, you and your clients have used infinite banking to really take their wealth to the next level. Absolutely. And so we're resonating on the same frequency. You basically said it's a safe, secure, liquid guaranteed asset right it it doesn't fail as long as you proceed with what was originally designed for the cash value account itself so it has that safety security and liquidity it's not an investment you know i had a very interesting conversation with a gentleman by the name of uh, a todd baldwin i believe his last name awesome youtube channel he's a real estate guy multi-millionaire um he's he's all about really maximizing making as much money as he possibly can to protect his family great language is very important when you are discussing financial matters because it can determine a taxable event from a non-taxable event a certain jurisdiction over another jurisdiction right so language is very very key when we say something is not an investment, therefore, you cannot compare what is not from what is. Does that make sense? So often a lot of people struggle with comparing this particular product, cash value life insurance, with some of the normal things that they're accustomed to, IRAs, um, uh, Roths pension plans, 401ks, 403b plans, brokerage accounts, you name it, right? So we do have to separate. And some people, like my friend Todd Baldwin, truly believes that they're interchangeable, one in the same. He does not separate savings from investings. We had a, we had a very, very deep conversation on this so that I can get into his mindset and I say, okay, now I know why you don't have this particular asset and others do because he does not separate saving dollars from investing dollars. Every dollar he brings in to his economy immediately gets pushed out into investments that he believes in, that he masters in, that he knows very well, and he's producing cash flow. That's a strategy. That's that's great. But when we start separating one man's philosophy or two man's philosophies or three or all these different opinions, at some point we have to go back to what what is a foundational truth in the matter of finance in terms of how our jurisdiction of the United States, our commercial regulated jurisdiction actually operates. And in the IRS tax code, everything is codified and explained as to what is and what is not, right? If I have money that I generate inside of a, a, a multiple flow of trust, of a trust flow model, I make money in that model, no taxes is incurred. But the same can happen if I make that same money in an LLC or an S-corp or a C-corp. Now I'm liable for taxes. Why? Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a territory over which a government rules its laws and order. 
So you and I live in the jurisdiction of the United States of America, and there are rules. Some people are playing chess, like you and I. Others are playing checkers, right? It's the same board, right? different pieces, right? So it is so important to separate so that you know where every dollar goes. And that goes back to my point about knowing your numbers. So when I'm working with people, I say, okay, you have a cash flow of X from that net cash flow after you spent your, your, your bills and you paid your debts. Where are you giving? Are you giving money? Okay, that's an expense. Are you saving money? You're saving $300 a month. Okay, where? In a bank account that's not earning anything. Okay, that $300 is different from the $400 a month that you're putting into your 401k, which is an investment which has a higher potential to yield a better result than the $300. So what Caleb and I do, just from watching your material and reading your book, you're separating that because you're saying this is the and asset and your 401k and your IRA and your Ross and this, this tool. And all we're trying to do is redirect the lack of your performance of your savings dollars. And then also the recapturing of your expenditures. Hence the whole creating a banking system for your, for your money, for your flow. Right? So we're resonating on that. That, that that's very, very key. It's not an investment in the tax code. It's not an investment. Section 7702 with the new MEC laws identifies and lays some of these things out. And I think there's some other um, codes that deal with um, cash value life insurance that I don't know off the top of my head, but it truly does separate it, right? And this tool pre-exists the IRS, which is why there's that separation of investment versus well, um, see, a non-investment. To quote Tom Wheelwright and his book, Tax-Free Wealth, the tax code, it's like the tax code is a few pages of telling you what you owe and then hundreds and thousands of pages on um, a treasure map and how to pay as little tax as possible. And you look at incentives. Government's going to incentivize what they want. If everyone owned life insurance, especially permanent life insurance, our country would be massively wealthy because we're making investments, not just in ourselves, but in the next generation. And uh, the government would not have to pay out as much in uh, other um, benefits because we are privately um, supporting our family, ourselves, and and our neighbors. And so it's one of those things where I I really believe everyone wins when this is done properly, um, and and the society is better off. If it wasn't, I think it would be one of those quote unquote loopholes that um, would potentially create a red flag or people would abuse. But at the end of the day, the government long term is better off when people are you know, doing this and it's the government's just a collective of people. And so that's just one of those things where I love what you're, what you're saying. And it's really good to be like, take a step back and say, man, like, I love that this is be like, like I get it because a lot of people will ask me like, Hey, like, when do you think this loophole will close and all that stuff? And it's like, that's, I think sometimes people overhype this and they're like, man, this is the best kept secret. It's not, but it's, it sure is amazing. Um, if we put on our realistic hat and say like, hey, this could be this could be great. The other thing that I'll say based on what your comments to Todd and others is if we just take out language. This is how I would simplify it. Person A doesn't have permanent life insurance, maybe buys term, invests the difference and goes on their merry way and hopefully lives a super happy life. Person B buys permanent life insurance, over funds it the way that you and I would, you know, recommend and utilizes it, hopefully leverages it. Are, is person B better off than person A? If the answer is no, then permanent life insurance is not this magic wand that they should have. The answer is yes. It doesn't matter what we call it. They're better off. I mean, you know, and you know what I'm saying? It's like, it really comes down to does this thing, does this widget, does this black box, does this whatever you want to call it, does it help you be more intentional? Does it help you get results? Does it get you what you want? And one of the things that I'm on a mission to doing is like educating on the multidimensional aspect of an asset. It's like not all assets are created equal. 
and there's some assets yeah. that give you more benefits than others. You might not let, like guarantee private protection, the death benefit might not mean anything to you. That doesn't make you a bad person. It's just like, I don't care about that. Well, then those benefits mean less than some other people that come to us that it means a lot to them. You know, what, right. what is the rate of return of having privacy and creditor protection? I don't know, but it is a benefit mm -hmm. and not all assets have that. Um, any, right. any comments on that before we jump into some of the language? Well, what, what, is your, what is your answer when that A and B situation, is it subjective or is it like? Yeah. Listen, I, oh, and I, 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 get, um, I get comments all over the place because I love, love permanent life insurance. I've written a book on this. I've interviewed Nelson Nash and I have some amazing friends and partners that are part of the infinite banking, um, you know, group. And I'm grateful for that. Like Nelson was a dear friend and I'm grateful for what he's done. And, and at the same time, I don't want to get wishy-washy and it's just like velocity banking. Like not any one of these strategies is just magical. It, it has a lot ah, more to do with okay. your mindset. Right. And at the end mm -hmm. of the day, if someone, if they, if they will not live more intentionally and they won't, you know, go through the process correctly, they may be better off buying term insurance and investing the difference. That doesn't make life insurance a fraud or a scam. That just makes it right. Nice. They are not going to utilize the tool. And as a result, the tool is going to actually create a drag in their household economy. Yeah. So you're not taking the approach that velocity banking is for everyone, infinite banking is for everyone. Like that, I don't take that approach either. I think that's what I'm getting from your, your scenario. It's, it's a matter of, what is the most effective thing that's going to improve your life? Right. right? How do we yep. solve for that yep. as, as insurance agents, as consultants, as content creators, uh, essentially quote unquote gurus, how do we convey that, that message to the audience where, Hey, instead of comparing and, and getting in that, that game, it's a, it's a sucker's game to right. really compare this with that and that with this and this with that, like, what if you encompassed a, a multitude of everything and created your own custom strategy? You know, whenever I talk to my audience, I make jokes. I'm like, you've got grandpa Dave, you've got uncle G, and then you've got cousin D. You can get something from all three of us, right? Uncle Dave is old school. Uncle G is, is old school with new school thoughts. And then cousin D is right in between, right? Your personal finance key to the 21st century. I'm, I'm taking from the best of the both worlds of right. what they have to right. offer. And I made it my own. And now I'm sharing it and saying, here's, a, here's an effective strategy. And the whole, uh, the whole idea of you know finance, you can put that on, a, on an index card. Everything you need to know about finance, you can just put on an index card. That is a, to me, that's a false mentality. Right. No way. There's no way that that's also a sucker's game to assume that you can just put everything about finance on a, on a simple index card, right? Everything you need right. to know. And then you're quote unquote going to be free. That is not the case. Right. I, I do believe that you, you, you need know. to simplify it to a framework. You need to simplify it. But, yeah, but a you framework, can absolutely like, simplify it. Yeah. Leverage could be a part of the framework and we could give yeah. you a hundred examples of how to use leverage. Yeah. There's no, I mean, especially my bad handwriting, <laughs> I, I would, I would get to, I would get to the third lever and run out of room. So, um, exactly. man, I, so I love this. Like, I, I, I love I've, this too. This is good. Yeah. I I've, um, watched a lot of your videos and, um, you know, I, I know that one thing that you switched in your language is instead of saying borrowing from a life insurance policy, you're, you're talking about borrowing against, um, I want to want to talk about other epiphanies that you've had that you're like, man, like, um, what are some of the things that you've learned about quote unquote infinite banking that you like that you you have learned now that you've been in the process, you get the honor of getting connected with all kinds of people that are gurus that you and I yeah. both learn from. What are some of the other epiphanies that you've learned uh, in language? And have you grown up more convicted over permanent life insurance or do you, do you feel like you're less convicted as you're just realizing like, Oh, it's not, it's not the hype train that I thought it was to be. Correct. I was very excited about the, I was like, Oh my God, this is like, yo, this is the thing. But then as I began to really learn more and more, I'm like, it's not really all that guys. It's not going to make you a multimillionaire. Let's not fall into that category as insurance agents where this is the one and done 
type of strategy. That is a, that is a sucker's game. Right. Don't do that. Right. Cause now you're just, again, you're comparing it to you just putting money into a 401k and expecting this thing to give you financial freedom. That's not how financial freedom works at all. It's a multitude of you re discovering who you are as a person, how you operate most effective on this planet, and then what requirements, what resources you need to conduct yourself effectively. So there's way more to it than just, oh, well, instead of putting my money in a 401k, I'm gonna put it here. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't play that game with people. I'm just like, keep your 401k, keep your religion and have this too, right? So to speak, like you've got a religion about your money. Here's another philosophy. Right. Keep what you're doing. Right. How do we add to it? And then you might come to a conclusion that, oh, shoot, what I'm doing kind of sucks. This is, I mean, I got to deal with the 40% ordinary income tax rate. How do I release that liability and move that into this tax-free component? And wouldn't I have more technically? The number would be less, but I'd have more, right? That was another thing. That's an, a, a, that was a huge epiphany for me right. that I discovered right. with cash value life insurance versus you know, and this is not the most effective way to do this, but it does have some merit to it where I was um, recently just running some numbers with a gentleman who is uh, 51 years old and he's got like, I think over 350 plus K in his um, 401k and he's going to keep funding it. I think till age 65, he predicted he would have $3 million in there and he could live fine for the rest of his life. And I told him, you're sadly mistaken, my friend. That's not enough money. Like, even if you acquired $5 million, even if you acquired $7 million, it's not enough money. And here's why. It's the way you accumulated it. Because what you're not accounting for is the taxes, which you will be at the highest tax rate, ordinary income tax, when you distribute those funds out of your 401k, number one. Number two. You're not, you're not accounting for inflation. Inflation is now over 7% and it's rising. And every year, the cost of goods, while your money is growing, the cost of your living is also growing with it, right? Then you've got the whole devaluation thing of money, right? Then you've got cost and fees. And here's where I would argue in many cases, the cash value life insurance supersedes this. It beats this right here. It eliminates this, stays ahead of this, right? And you don't have to worry about devaluation necessarily as long as you are using the vehicle to acquire other vehicles that can combat that, right? And again, the costs and fees are, are less over the long haul. So a lot of people don't account for costs and fees. And then the one big one, is losses. So this was a huge epiphany for me. When you do the math, um, they, you know, the gurus tell you, you take 4%, yep. right. Yep. Uh, distribution of $3 million a year. So that's 120 grand a year. Right. And he was saying that when he's, he's this age, when, when he's here, his cost of living will be this. And I said, no, it will not. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be more like here, buddy. So you're going to have to take out more. And my friend, what happens when you're 65 and you do your first distribution, whether it's on a monthly or an annual basis, and then another COVID breaks out or another bank bailout or another recession or another depression or another black market or another market crash or real estate crash. So you lose 20% of $3 million. Do you know how much harder it is just to recapture what you lost, right? So if I lose 20% of 3 million, that's 600 right. grand. What most people don't realize is if you earned, right? So you went from, you went from 3 million, right? And then you minus 600 grand. Now you're at 2.4. What would be the rate of return just to restore back to 3 million. I promise you it's not 20. Right. It's way more right. than that just to break even. Right. And that's that's why they're saying the 4% rules 
aggressive with this typical model and some people are saying three percent or three and a half percent so that just brings your 120 number down lower yes you include Less. inflation it's it's a uh, you're gonna your cost of living just to maintain your current standard of living is going to increase and then the big thing is what are taxes going to be on that 120 i don't know yeah it's going to be something and that's then, ordinary income and so and then here's yeah here's where i blow people's minds i say what if i just helped you generate at least a half a million a year, right? And I use my numbers, right? I said, I, I, I almost made almost a half a million one year, right? My total expenses that year uh, was somewhere around 200K. So the net, let's say this is your expense. You, you generate 500K, right? You spend 200, taxes, costs, fees, operation, right. living, everything. You net three. Right. This is your online e-commerce business. Let's just say you net 300 K. You could even go lower than that. Right. Say, say half 50%, 250 K. My friend, 250 K in cash flow after everything is done. Divide that by 12. My friend, that's 20 grand a month versus 120 divided by 12. That's 10 thousand and i didn't again we have to minus your cost of living yeah well and right and, and so and, most people are just solving for oh i just need to cover my 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 lifestyle and i will that's not a good model my friend you need to have access for emergencies the fact that you're going to get older healthcare is going to get more expensive and i just start dropping these things i'm like the number that your problem isn't accumulating right well, right. You, you need a, per, well, that is the problem. Well, let, the problem let me is you're this. accumulating. <laughs> let me ask you this. This is take that 500 gross number and divide yeah. it by 0 0.04. Tell, tell us what number that's going to be. So if you take 500,000 500, and divide, divide it by 0 0.04, which represents the 4% rule, the distribution, you're going to get a number of 12 million plus 12 million plus. Okay. So what's, what's easier? Is it, is it to accumulate 12 million or is it to create 500? Now these are both big numbers, right? Yeah, but uh, but one of the things that we like to do is reverse engineer the. It's like, what's easier to, to hope to accumulate your money and hope it grows and, you know, or figure out levers where it's like creating half a million dollars. Don't get me wrong. That's not like, that's not easy. But it's like, I would take that all day long. And when you realize a half a million dollars income stream is an equivalent of having a 12 plus million dollar portfolio, you, you wonder why it's like, man, um, what, why am Dude, I doing just broke, what I'm just doing? blew my mind with that math. I just <laughs> blew my mind with that math. I didn't, I, cause I didn't know what you were getting at. Cause I'm, you know, uh, I often tell people, I'm like, I'm not a math guru. Like I'm still learning. But that little equation that you did, because I was like, what does he mean? 500 and I divided by zero. I got 12.5 million. I thought I was doing something wrong. <laughs> but then you said it and you were like, it's over 12 mil. And I'm like, oh, he's talking about the amount of you the distribution to, yeah. to, to, to have that. Yep. You so would be 12.5 million. If we're, take, if, we're, if we're playing the typical traditional game, we then- A 4%. We, we, yeah. And, and if it's 3%, uh, then do it's it even, even worse. It's, it's probably be around. Oh my million. god! So it's like that's that's the game from a standpoint. Is this is what's fun? Is this is actually more realistic? If you can create ten thousand dollars of cash flow, and we're going to play the four percent rule, take ten thousand divided by point zero four. What do you? What is that number? Ten thousand divided by zero point four, two hundred fifty k. Okay. So what is easier? You're starting off. You're starting off. You're twenty one years old. What is easier mm -hmm. to try to create ten thousand dollars of cash flow, or to do the typical route and save up two hundred fifty? Right, it's way easier to produce cash flow today, especially now more than ever before. And, the ten k and and, and there, if there's pushback again, because I'm cool if there's pushback, because I'm all about efficiency and there's not one size fits all. Um, mm -hmm. But I I tend to agree with you, and um, and it's it's just one of those things where. It, it helps us just think differently because what is the goal of retirement? What's the goal of accumulating money? What's the goal of putting it in the 401k? Create cash flow. I just think right. that it's not the most efficient way to create cash flow when you look at all the other leverage effects. And so, man, this is so much fun.
We could t- we should really yeah. talk more. This is great. It blew my mind just now. Um, and I hope the audience <laughs> caught that. What we just went over here. You 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 see the the break. Like I have been blessed to work with people that are double and triple my age. That's my average client age is 45, 55 and up. Every single one of those clients that are between 55, approaching retirement, 59, 65, not one of them can honestly say to me that they're financially free, independent, and the ones that did everything correctly, Denzel, I have a pension. I have a social security. I, I have the, the pension and I have income from, uh, uh, cause they were veterans. So they have income from the government, from being a vet. They got a pension. They got a 401k. They got a Roth. Still not enough money. I'm like, wait a minute. You did everything right here. I have a client that makes good money on paper, but they're still cash flowing to 3000, 4000. And they got a $1.2 million home and they got student loans and they got these other debts. So they, they have that issue, the, the debt part, but they also have not solved for enough cash flow because you don't have enough money to live the lifestyle that you actually want to live. Right. Um, and what's even worse is you don't even have enough money to sustain the lifestyle you currently have. So you have to downgrade. And then there's this whole notion about you being an empty nester, having less bills, your debts are paid off. Well, that's not happening. In my experience, working with hundreds of families all across every, all the 50 states, right? That's not happening. And I'm witnessing this at 26 years old. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is, what is the deficiencies yeah. in these strategies that these, that these people are doing? Because these are smart people, doctors. Lawyers yep. telling you, uh, I mean, we're, but, so but again, people. we're not thinking with the end in mind where, I mean, I could exactly. take every area of someone's life. They're not thinking with the end in mind. And so we're, we're, we're just deferring, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to defer our tax. We're going to do this, 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 this. Mm-hmm. And if we actually understood how income planning works, we would potentially think a little bit differently. <laughs> I'm biased, but I, you know, I'm biased because I've seen the numbers. I've seen the exact same people that you've talked to. And it's like, man. I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to trade places with them. And if I would have no, knowing what I know, what would I have done differently? And it all comes down to make decisions today to enhance the result that you want. And if and if you're re, if you're going for retirement planning, your let's call it what it really is is future cash flow planning, and optimize it for future cash flow, because you, unless it's legacy, and then optimize it for legacy, you know. And so it's it's one of those things where. Um, I really do believe you can fit it on, you can fit your core principle and framework on a note card, and then you got to work with experts to really go deep and make sure that each one of those areas are optimized. Yeah. Going back to infinite banking, by the way, there's one other thing I want to <laughs> say, and we're like running way off the of time. I don't know if you have a hard stop, but I'm grateful, I'm good, grateful man. for your time. I, I, I blocked out a lot of time. We're good. Um, yeah. So a lot of people say they're recapturing their interest and, or they're, you know, running their expenses through their infinite banking. These, this, I want to have an authentic combo with you. You've, you've, I mentioned the expenses thing. Um, I think those are two areas that we got to be very careful about. And there's a lot of people that just, that's where they get confused. It's like they read a book and they're like, oh, yeah. I'm going to go buy a car and go on vacation. And I'm, I'm going to make money and I'm going to run my expenses and my premium is going to equal my income. And then my policy is recapturing interest and I'm paying interest back to myself. And I'm like, okay. Half truths, right? Because it's like, I yes, is it more efficient to buy a liability with a policy versus cash? Asterisk, yes. And I'm, I hope we understand the core principles. And I would go out and get a bank loan, and and if I could, if I'm okay with the payment, if it's more efficient than borrowing from the insurance company, and recapturing interest is essentially my money is able to grow, but my interest is going to the insurance company, not me. So these are some of the things I just want to talk about because um, I think it will be a really interesting discussion. I feel like we can talk about anything in this space. So I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you and we'll, we'll uh, further this convo. Yeah, so I have also made 
tweaks on this strategy as well. And I've come to the conclusion that the only expenses that I see valuable running through a policy is anything that I can earn cash back rewards on and any bill that I can actually reduce the bill by switching it from a monthly to an annual. And I laid this out in uh, a quite a few videos with my own numbers. And I'll do it here quickly because it's still fresh in my mind. Um, and again, I go back to the root of which dollars I am allocating to the cash value life insurance. So me personally, in my business, I've been blessed. I'm saving a little over six figures a year in, in cash value life insurance. I have two policies myself, which equal 85,000 a year. So just dealing with one policy that I'm funding 70,000 a year, right? Yeah. It's, it's $70,000 of savings dollars, money that has no purpose yet sits in a bank account, has no purpose. Now, instead of me sending all of that to my cash value life insurance policies, right? I, I do, I have like a rule where I do like a portion, right? Of all of my income that I make, I have like a 10, 10, 10 type of rule that I, that I do. Um, but I also was experimenting with the whole expense, right? Running expenses. I'm like a lot of insurance guys talk about this and they're recovering. They're talking about recovering 50% opportunity costs and these wild numbers. And I'm like, something's not adding up for me because I'm not getting the same results. So I, you know, before I practice, before I teach a thing, I like to try to practice it and experiment it with first to see what I get. So from my 70 grand that I'm putting into this one whole life insurance policy contract, $26,000 of bills, expenses, I'm going to put in the policy first, then borrow out and pay the expense, right? And I want to see what is the net result from that. Um, and the other thing I let my clients know is right off the bat, when you start a policy, the first one to two years, your most expensive years. So you're already negative, maybe 18% right. or more, right. depending on how you split the premiums and the cash value dollars, right? So if you did a 50-50 split, where you got 50% of 70 grand going to cash, 50% of your 70 grand going to um, whole life insurance based premium, you have a net loss technically on the cash value in the first year of more than negative 50%. It's like negative 60% or more, which is why I always tell my clients, listen, that's a bad strategy. There's agents that are designing policies that way for infinite banking, calling it infinite banking. And it's, it's not ideal. It's not efficient. So I say, you know, lower those premiums down, increase the cash value a little bit more to help with your negative starting point in right. year one. So that's the first thing. And I account for that. 26 grand I've identified in my bills and my expenses. This is money per year that I can run through a credit card. Okay. Earning anywhere from two to 3% in cash back rewards and the net number that I recapture is 12%, which is $3,120. Where's that 12% coming from? Is that from points? From point, Yeah. Cash straight up cash back rewards and points that I can convert to statement credit. Right. Okay. The, the real, more realistic number is somewhere anywhere from three to five K, but I went with the lower okay. number. Right. Okay. So okay. 3,120. So technically I've reduced my expenses from 26,000, right? Minus the 3,120. So now I'm at 22 is really what I'm actually pulling from the policy as a loan okay. at say 5%, right? I know the loan interest rates have gone down to three to 4% as of right. late. Um, but in 2018, 2019 is when I established my policy. So loan rate is, is say 5%. And you're, and you're pulling out, when you say pulling out, you're borrowing against to pay off the credit card balance. Pay off the credit card. Yes. So wouldn't so the credit I'll card run... balance be actually 26, 
because the points would come at a later date? So the points, I can uh, accumulate this. It, it, your points are accumulated immediately. Okay. So I can just, every, every um, due date, I can apply it. Okay. Right. So okay. Uh, was it 320 divided by 12? It's like $260 a month okay. that I can apply to the different credit cards. So it lowers the bill. Okay. Right. And then my net, my actual net out of the policy is, is this number, right? So in addition to this 26 grand, the actual, when I look at the actual cost of my bills, it's a little bit higher than 26 grand because I was paying, say, a monthly expense of um, a lot of the business subscriptions that I have. And you know how when you sign up for Zoom or Kajabi or ConvertKit, when you pay annual, you save 10%, right. save 15%. Right. Right. Uh, Netflix pay for the year, right? Whatever it is. So I look at all those things and I convert everything to annual, run it on the card. The card that I get is usually a 0% for 6, 12, 18, 24 months. I'm paying the monthly minimum, right? You're, you're and paying then the monthly minimum on the card? On the card, yes, because there's no interest, right? Okay. Fair. And then I let the money in the policy season in the policy for as long as humanly possible. And then I'll pull it out in one shot, pay the credit card off in one shot, do it again the next year. Right. How are you so, paying that loan back though? See, that is the issue. So what I do is I actually don't pay the loan at all. I, I let it stay outstanding and I just cover the interest. So 22,880 times 5% simple interest is 1,144. So in this example, technically I'm okay. I, it didn't cost me any more dollars because this money offset my borrowing costs for the policy. Does that make sense? I, I'm tracking what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that right there is technically a win. Okay. That's cool but I'm still negative on the policy itself. It, that's going to take maybe four to seven years before the cash value starts to break even and start producing a positive one, two, three, 4% return. So the conclusion I've come to is that this can only work for a few years before it don't matter because I'm saving on average uh, roughly 15% by switching from monthly to annual. So it's a 15% right. savings on average. And I'm getting 12% uh, a total off the cash back rewards, right? Uh, a, a total uh, right. A net savings, right? Uh, or cash back rewards of, of everything that's uh, running through the card itself, right? So I'm earning three to 5K off the bills. So that's if I'm doing right. the math right, right. it's 12% right. of 12, that right. number. I, okay, cool. I, yep. You want me even to with okay. even with that, that still negative. And eventually this number starts to get pretty high. The your your borrowing costs on the loans. Because yeah. you gotta do it again yeah. the next year. And your the next year, standing the next loan year. is bigger and your interest charge this number is growing. Yep. Mm -hmm. So eventually this supersedes this. So now I am coming out of pocket. And then there's the whole notion of, yes, when you pay interest back to your policy that, you know, it, it goes to the company and the company pays you in the form of dividends. Okay. But that's, that's not a reliable um, measurement for me. Like I know yeah. what I'm getting from the insurance company. Right. This is a completely different right. cost. So I've come to the conclusion that it only works for a period of time. It should not be a lifetime type of thing in the policy. Uh, I don't see the full value in it. Right. Um, well, I know I can do. I know I can do better. With yeah. Other things. Yeah. So, so I'll I'll give you my two cents on this, and I appreciate you breaking this math down. Um, I I think I think number one. Um, what is the main goal when you read infinite banking um, and what 
Nelson talked about. It, it actually came in the form of a, of a shot analogy where he talks about volume versus rate. It doesn't matter, you know, how fast the, the liquid goes into your arm. It's, it's the volume that can really get you in trouble. And so my, I think we can both agree that the volume of savings is a good thing. If we can help our yes. clients save more money, they're having a greater volume growing, hopefully, and by nature, they'll have control over those dollars, which I'll be the first to say some, some people will do worse with control because of bad behavior and habits, but mm -hmm. we're making the, we're making the assumption that if you have control, it's going to be a positive thing. That's why this is not for everybody. And yeah. I simplify it as much as here's my principle. The most efficient way in whatever scenario is what is allowing me to save more money. Now, if we, if I'm borrowing at five, to use your example, and I am buying a CD at 4% in one year, what my policy is going to grow regardless. We can agree on that. Yeah. But my policy yeah. is going to internally give me all the benefits of life insurance, which, which is, is amazing. But if I'm borrowing at five and earning four, I just created a negative 20% arbitrage on my money in that year. Yes. Like, hey, yes. let me pay, let me pay you five dollars and you give me four back. I'm not I'm not a genius. I and you would say some people would say, well, I'm a genius because my policy's growing and I got four dollars. Well, your policy's gonna grow regardless. Mm -hmm. So so you'd be better off not doing that transaction. Um, and so mm -hmm. I and this might be this is this is why I want to have a discussion. In that scenario that you went through mathematically you'd be better off paying cash for those expenses. I, I love what you're doing annualizing using credit cards. Mathematically, you would actually be better off paying cash and, and allowing yourself to take that extra savings versus the monthly, mm -hmm. since you're saving that 12 plus 5%, all those things, and just saving more in the policy. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? So that's yeah, like, the, you know, and then the other thing is, the other thing is, um, and I, this is, I get people that don't like when I say this, but it's like, if I'm going to make a purchase, let's say it's a car, yeah. if I'm going to make a purchase, the, the first, first thing I need to do is I need to say, should I buy this car? It has nothing to do with, do I have the money? Do, do I have the credit capacity? It's like, should I buy this car? And you, we need to have some kind of framework to decide that. A lot of times we, Dave Ramsey puts that, you know, how you should buy something with what you should buy. So I'm going to buy this car and it's $10,000. And I have $200,000 of cash value. I have money in the bank and I have a credit union that I could borrow, uh, borrow from. And it really comes down to, I'm looking at my scenario and saying, okay, payment is not an issue in this case. So I'm either going to take a policy loan at 5%. Now, a lot of these companies are 4%. So 4% policy loan. My, I could take a 0%. I could take my cash money out of cash. Um, or I could take a, you know, a bank or a credit union and let's say it's a 2.5 in my head I i'm going to take the 2.5 take take that pay the credit union because i respect that my money in my policy and my money in the banking i re, i have a more respect for liquidity and control more than two and a half percent got it you know and so it's just it's 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 um that's the thing where where you know if we have if we have a hatred for banks Life insurance can be a, a, a way to okay. stay fed. Yeah. yeah, so you just brought up a good point. So there is a sector of people that just don't want to deal with dealerships, don't want to deal with borrowing from banks and taking loans. So, so I say, well, in that case, yeah, you could save, save your money in cash value life insurance and borrow from yourself to finance something. Right. And if right. you were to compare it to... um getting a 5% car loan, 7% car loan versus a 4% simple interest right. loan on your policy. Right. Yeah, there is a, a, a benefit there. Um, so I, I definitely work with a lot of different clients that um, do that. And I've also created content where I talk about right. running right. bills through your policy in the most, in my, in my thought process, I'm okay, if you're going to do it, because I can't stop you. Right. If you're going to do it, at least do it right. in the most efficient possible way you can. Right. And you're still going to net a negative. 
Right. And, right. and, and I, I use my it. numbers. Right. I use my numbers to prove it. Like well, you're eventually yeah. going to net a negative and in the right. first couple of years, maybe not if you do right. it right, but you're eventually going to net a negative, especially when you compare it to right. something else you could have done. Like maybe like I'm at a point now where I use my policies for uh, syndicating. Right. And right. I also use it to actually run the personal side of, of my life and even the, the business side. So I know my business is going to produce 30, 40% profits. Let me, you can then argue that, Oh, well, if he ran his business expenses through his policy, it's costing him X, but he's producing a 30, 40% return Okay, well then he made sense of it. So right, as long as you're growing your business, it's it's just as one long of those as you're growing like, your business. How many people? It's one of those things. How many people are going to do that? Business, you know exactly. You know, it's like exactly. invest in your number one asset, which I'm a huge fan of. Like I'm, we're going to double our business, and you know we go mm -hmm. out of business. But here's here's what I'll say, <laughs> and, and I, I want to say two other things is is like I really appreciate this convo because I think we're I think we're going to help a lot of people, and just because there's going to be some people that really relate with how you're articulating, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some people that relate with I with how. I, I articulate it, and the hope is to increase the financial literacy of just both of our communities. Um, so, the, so the thought process is number one: um, if, if like I'm not a huge fan of using you know policy to pay off debt or to buy lifestyle stuff, I've made that clear. And the asterisk that might be the right thing that someone needs to do because they'll never start saving. They like they'll never start, okay. and so they're like, like okay, okay. So what's what's better? And this goes back to Dave Ramsey. There's some people that should pay off their mortgage. There's some people that should crowd up their credit cards because it's yeah. the mortgage and the credit card that are like, they're, they're not like, it, it, you have to put in human behavior. So while I'll yes. make it very clear, I'm not going to go on record saying like, do this and pay personal expenses and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily pay off debt. It would, does mathematically make sense if you're borrowing at five to pay off higher debt. That's, that's mathematically a more yeah. efficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will say that, you know, there are some people that that works we just have to be super conservative because normally those are the same type of people that get in financial pinches and then their policy could be at risk because they're over leveraged and then we have that uncomfortable conversation the the next thing i'll say whether it's a a debt or an an investment and let's just suppose for the moment that it could be 12 percent, and you're able to borrow at five and make 12%. Let's 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 do the math here. You're you're getting all the benefits of life insurance and it, you're going to get those benefits regardless. It's costing you 5% in my book I talk about it being a control cost and you're able to earn 12. So going back to the equation, if I give you 5 and you give me 12 back, that's 140% return on my money. And my cash value is still doing its thing cuz my policy I'm, I'm using it as collateral. So when we talk about giving your dollar more than one job, I like that's yeah. It, so it's my whole philosophy is if we're going to take a if we're going to take a borrowing, if we're going to borrow, I, I call it control cost, whatever that control cost is, we got to make sure that whatever activity we're doing is creating a greater result or greater outcome than the cost of controlling capital, whether it's at U.S. bank, life insurance policy, or if it's paying cash. And there's a cost of paying cash because it's when we pay cash, we're taking this money and now we're, we're surrendering it. We're never able to have it back. So it's not just free. There's a cost yeah. to giving up control. And so again, man, like I appreciate this because we're, you know, the hope yeah, is we're to being increase the real IQ transparent. Of, yeah. Yeah. Which and uh, and we're not you're and you're doing it in a way where you're not like really uh shunning or, or hating on what others have done okay or pretty good or not so good with their policy. You know, the other argument to defend those who do run their cars and I mean, run anything and everything through their policy in their defense, they're looking at it as like, that was money I was going to spend anyways. Right. So by having it go through the policy first and that money is going to grow forever, I'm willing to pay that quote unquote control cost. And I've done videos in support of that, but just like the evolution of my YouTube channel, you know, there were things that I've said in 2018 that I don't necessarily align with all the way in now 2022. Finance is very, you know, uh, you got to be adaptable 
very fluid with it and willing to be wrong so that you can course correct. So I've been wrong so many times in the past and I keep those videos up and I even comment. I'm like, hey, I was wrong. I made a mistake here on this video. I'm showing you I'm human. I'm showing you I make mistakes. Um, don't rely on everything I say. Don't just take it as gospel, but rather trust, but verify, trust, but ver verify. And even in those videos where I've made mistakes, I'm like, run these numbers, prove right. me wrong, yeah. run the numbers, prove me. And then I have people who come back and say, Hey, uh, you, you made a mistake here. Or, Hey, um, instead of saying borrowing, maybe you should say, uh, uh, I still get that wrong. Uh, again, barring from a barring versus, against. Yeah. yeah. And that was another little epiphany I had. Um, my mentor, Steve Parisi, actually took me to the language of what insurance companies use in their actual language. And so borrowing from and borrowing against is more of like an insurance agent. It's like an agency agent language um, that's used. But from what I understand, the insurance language, they actually say borrowing from yep. your cash value yep. policy. So eh, don't beat yourself up. I think I was beating myself up a little bit. I was like, wait, am I guiding people wrong on this? But I've now told my clients, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to beat myself up if I say borrow from, borrow against. You know what I mean. If you don't know, here's what I say in the video. I'm borrowing. I'm taking from yeah. here this, to here. This, this policy, whether we want to call it much. infinite banking or the and asset <laughs> is allowing you to create a loan. And you could say, I'm, I'm borrowing from my infinite banking strategy. So, yeah. Dude. So I try not to let the client beat themselves up right because i'm like as long as you get the the, the fundamentals We're, um you're gonna do okay here's you know, what I'll then say. it's just a matter of, of, of mastering it here's what i'll say dude is we're talking we're, we're able to have a deep conversation there's not a lot of people that are willing to get deep and talk about certain things so a lot of times i feel like people are pretty surface level and like all this stuff so i appreciate that about just our friendship and and our ability to speak on this and i hope we can do more of this and so that that's the first thing I'll say. And then and then the second thing I'll say is um, we're talking about some deep, powerful strategies. And let's be let's be frank, the fact that someone's watching this right now is is um the fact that they know what infinite banking is or potentially knows what inf um our velocity banking is and understands yeah. leverage Tap and value creation. Like yeah. going back to our example, it's like, yeah, we could we could ne negotiate like what is the better way to do this thing? And the majority of the world is doing the three percent or four percent rule and will never become wealthy because they're not they don't have an ounce of leverage working in their favor. And and yet, you know, so it's just one of those things. Perspective tells you that um, pat yourself on the back. Um, give us a follow like this video, share it with people that need to hear this. Uh, Denzel, yeah, yeah. is there anything else that you want to share, man? Like I, this has been one of the longest interviews that I've done, but I'm, I'm grateful for the long form. I'm sure this will be chopped up in some areas, but then obviously for those brave people, we, they can listen to all the way through. Oh, um, I any, promise you that those, those are the people that are your clients. That's right. Or that's will right. become clients. So it's a numbers game at the end of the day, this thing only gets a thousand views. Like the reality is the people that are actually looking for this type of content are also looking for the relationship and connection with their agent. Um, and that's something that this is us practicing how we can be even more ethical and more responsible with our clients. So that's a good, you know, another epiphany I had is my, my mindset when I'm working with a client, I earn a commission and I get paid one time. And then I'm going to receive a residual commission off that one client for the next 10 years, roughly in my head frame, I'm like, how can I continuously give value to that one client, not in just those 10 years, but the next 20, the next 30, the next 40, to the point where I get invited to their funeral. I get invited to the kid's wedding. You know, I'm a part of that household. Right. And, right. you know, I've been, I've, again, been so blessed to talk with other insurance agents and see how they're running their practices and I'm able to identify what I like and what I don't like. There's one agent I, I had the privilege, privilege of actually meeting in person here in South Florida. He was telling me he's personally delivered checks to um, his clients uh, or that have uh, pa or helped, helped in the process of getting their death benefits and things like that. And it's a powerful thing. Yeah. 
um, to have worked with someone and then they pass away and then you see the thing do what it said it was going to do. And then you help them put the next policy in place and put the next assets in place. And you, now you're working with the spouse or now you're working with the son or the daughter of the mother or father that you were working with. So again, I'm 26. And again, most of my clients are double, almost triple my age. It's very likely a lot of my clients are going to pass away before I do. So I'm doing everything in my power to have the utmost integrity with these video that these videos that we do. So allowing that client base that you have, that I have, and then the, the growing client base, those are the ones that actually watch this video and they're really going to appreciate this. And they're going to watch the whole hour and a half, however long we've been going almost two hours, <laughs> almost, yeah, almost two hours. Now they're going to take that as like, I want these guys. That's right. That's I right, want yeah. them to be at my funeral. I want them to make sure that my wife is taken care of. Right. Because I want to make sure that my kids receive the same knowledge that Caleb and the Zell's receiving. We're, I mean, do we're examples for the next generation uh, right, and dude. the current generation. So we have a lot of stress on our shoulders, right? And we don't show it, but we've got a lot that we um, are carrying the, right. the, the integrity that we have to keep the value that we have to present and give to our clients, new clients, existing clients, selling to the prospects, and then just maintaining that uh, uh, ultimate, like, hey, if I'm wrong, let's course correct. Right. Caleb, if I get something wrong, I expect Caleb to reach out to me, then yeah. Zell, you should look into that. You know, you might, eh, might want to look into that. And I have some YouTubers that do that, and I really appreciate it. And dude, it's helped me grow even more, grow the channel more, get more views. Right. That's, that's um, the funny and, thing is, this is not a scarcity world. It's like the people that are abundant that share, that are open, are going to grow and impact more people because they're we're not focused on this small little pie that we're operating in. It's like it's it's possible that we could teach 20, 30 percent of people in America to start thinking leverage. And um, there's a, a lot of people that 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 equates to a lot of people. So, dude, um, we're, we'll put your info in the description. Um, any, 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 uh, anything else that you would like to give away or any, any call to actions from, from this podcast, obviously your YouTube channel is an incredible resource. I would encourage everyone watching this to go check you out, give you a subscribe, subscribe and, um, and just follow what you're doing, man. This is, this is the, the yeah. way that we're going to up our game is, is by getting, getting more people educated about this concept of leverage. I would say some, some, just to close out you know, in regards to velocity banking, the different ways that you can use that. When you go to my channel, I tend to usually tell people to go back, start from the beginning, work your way up. But over the recent years, I've created some really, really good playlists that puts everything in chronological order. So I have a playlist called velocity banking pregame work, I have a playlist that talks about all about the line of credit, how to get it, questions to ask. It's all free. And I got a playlist that's literally velocity banking, real life case studies. I'm using low income, high income, mid income, fluctuating income, salary income, hour. I mean, you name it. So many different scenarios that help you determine whether or not this is right for you because it's yeah. not right for everybody. And I allow the math to tell you whether it's correct or not. You have to yield a positive, better result than debt snowball, debt avalanche. Debt snowball, debt avalanche are measuring stick. If you can't beat debt snowball or debt avalanche with velocity banking, then you're better off sticking with debt snowball, debt avalanche in terms of paying off debt. Right. You know, just keeping it like that. Infinite banking, Caleb's got his practice. I'm partnered with Steve Parisi. I don't necessarily personally write and design the policies. Think of me as more of a strategist where I am more so having conversations and making videos on once the policy is in place, now what? Before the policy is in place, here are all the things you should talk to about your agent. Here are the things that you should qualify the agent with. The agent is qualifying you. You also need to qualify the agent as a customer. It's really helpful. Yep. And have the intent that this agent um, is going to be with you for a really long time. So see if they're planning on staying in this career or if this is just a, a stepping stone. And if it is, see if they're a part of an agency 
where if anything happens to him or her, you can still tap into an agency and have a, a direct connection. I can't, I can't tell you how many clients I get from other agencies that lack customer service. It's not that they don't know the stuff. Yeah. They just lack customer service. They lack attention. They lack education. And then these clients are coming to me and they're like, dude, I learned so much from your videos. Mm -hmm. I have an agent, but I was asking him about getting an enforced illustration. I was asking him about the policy loans. I was asking him about the dividend rate. And he was so defensive or she was so defensive and they kind of argued with me and made me feel like dumb. So I canceled the policy and I was like, no, why'd you do that? <laughs> so, <I'm, laughs> so, you know, I'll just say like, okay, before you make a move, before you switch and change an agent, let's see the, 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 the integrity of how good that policy was designed. We may not want to kill it. You might just want to do a reduced paid up so you don't have to pay premiums anymore right. and it just stays right. there and you have that ever increasing line of credit. So maybe we don't want to just kill it. Um, or maybe we don't want to just do a 1035 exchange, maybe just pay the monthly minimum on it because it's already established. Or, you know, if you just got it last year, then that's typically not so bad to do a 1035 exchange um, in like the first one or two years, usually. Um, but that's usually how I, you know, work with people. Um, I'm a strategist. I'm a consultant. I'm a coach. I, I'm going to do more than just help you put a policy in place, you know, and so will Caleb uh, just from his book alone and the videos that he puts out. So whomever you feel most comfortable with, like really do your due diligence on me, on Caleb, on others in the space. You know, I, I have a great partnership with uh, Steve Parisi over at IBC Global, whom you, I think, already collaborated with. I saw a small clip come out on your channel. So that was pretty cool. That's where I get a lot of my information from. Um, and yeah, there is the lack of licensed insurance agents right now below the age 40, I think it is. It's right. incredible. Right. It's incredible. The opportunity for the amount of um, current licensed insurance agents versus the amount of uninsured people in America. Right. The vast opportunity to make a lot of wealth, a lot of money. So I have no lack whatsoever. I know Caleb operates in no lack. Unfortunately, our elders in the infinite banking and insurance space tend to have their proprietary practices and don't want to open the doors and don't want to teach, don't want to collaborate. They throw hate, they throw shade. It's unfortunate. But Caleb and I are the next generation. We're coming up when, when the elders pass away and they expire and they go back to their Lord, their creator, we're setting the new example of how agencies can work together, can collaborate, eat your cake, right? Have your cake and eat it too, and still have more right. <laughs> like, right. Hey, um, Caleb, I, I got this client. They, um, they don't really, they don't want to go with me. They got this other design that they're looking at. Uh, can you reach out to them? Maybe you can help them design a policy. I want to make sure they get the right design. And I know that the current illustration they have right now that they are planning on going with is a bad design, but they're not seeing it. I didn't convey it right. Can you? Right. Boom. Now that client didn't go with the bad policy. They went with Caleb. I lost the money but the client got served properly. I'm willing to do that all day long, you know? And I even, I put people's names out. Like I did a video. Yeah, I saw that. I named, I named a bunch of the insurance players that I, I believe are, are doing, right. they have right. established practices. I don't, I don't agree with every single one of them, but here are the players. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's who's on, who I've seen. I've done my due diligence. Here's who is, who is existing. Yeah. It's really not a lot. It's really yeah. not a lot of us that are established. So, you know, if you find someone that's not on the list, let's add them to it, put them in the comments. Um, and if there's any imbalances you, or, or here's or, what I'm asking, you know, if you're watching till the end, please, uh, comment, please. Um, <laughs> you, you deserve a trophy and we appreciate your time and attention. Denzel, thank you. We'll put your contact yeah. info and your, uh, your Good YouTube stuff, in, in the uh, comments or not in the comments in the description. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for taking time and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you around.
dude, God bless. And let's, let's keep doing this. This is fun.